The Fairy Tale of the Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily In his little hut by the great river, which a heavy rain had swollen to overflowing, lay the ancient ferryman, asleep, wearied by the toil of the day. In the middle of the night, loud voices awoke him. He heard that it was travellers wishing to be carried over. Stepping out, he saw two large will-o'-the-wisps hovering to and fro on his boat, which lay moored. They said they were in violent haste and should have been on the other side already. The old ferryman made no loitering, pushed off and steered with his usual skill obliquely through the stream, while the two strangers whispered and hissed together in an unknown, very rapid tongue, and every now and then broke out in loud laughter hopping about one at a time, sometimes on the top edge of the boat, sometimes on the seats, and other times on the bottom of the boat. The boat is tipping, cried the old man. If you don't be quiet and still, it'll keel over. Be seated, gentlemen of the wisp. At this advice, they burst into a fit of laughter, mocked the old man, and were more unquiet than ever. He bore their mischief with silence and soon reached the farther shore. Here is for your labour, cried the travellers, as they shook themselves a heap of glittering gold pieces jingled down into the wet boat. For heaven's sake, what are you about? cried the old man. You will ruin me forever. Had a single piece of gold got into the water, the stream which cannot suffer gold, would have risen in horrid waves and swallowed both my skiff and me, and who knows how it might have fared with you in that case. Here, take back your gold. We can take nothing back which we have once shaken from us, said the lights. Then you give me the trouble, said the old man, stooping down and gathering the pieces into his cap, raking them together and carrying them ashore and burying them. The lights had leapt from the boat, but the old man cried, Stay, where is my fare? If you take no gold, you may work for nothing, cried the will-o'-the-wisps. You must know that I am only to be paid with fruits of the earth. Fruits of the earth? We despise them and have never tasted them. And yet I cannot let you go till you have promised that you will deliver me three cabbages three artichokes and three large onions. The lights were making off with jests, but they felt themselves in some inexplicable manner fastened to the ground. It was the most unpleasant feeling they had ever had. They engaged to pay him his demand as soon as possible. He let them go and pushed away. He was gone a good distance when they called to him. Hey, old man, the main point is forgotten. It was too late. He was off. He didn't hear them. He had fallen quietly down that side of the river, where, in a rocky spot, which the water never reached, he meant to bury the pernicious gold. Here, between two high rocks, he found a monstrous chasm, shook the metal into it, and steered back to his cottage. Now, in this chasm lay the fair green snake who was roused from her sleep by the gold coming chinking down. No sooner did she fix her eye on the glittering coins than she ate them all up with the greatest relish on the spot and carefully picked out such pieces as were scattered in the chinks of the rock. Scarcely had she swallowed them when, with extreme delight, she began to feel the metal melting inside her inwards and spreading all over her body. And soon, to her lively joy, she observed that she was grown transparent and luminous. Long ago, she had been told that this was possible. But now being doubtful whether such a light could last, her curiosity and her desire to be secure against her future drove her from her cell and she might see who it was that had shaken in this precious metal. She found no one. The more delightful was it to admire her own appearance and her graceful brightness as she crawled along through roots and bushes and spread out her light among her grass. Every leaf seemed of emerald, every flower was dyed with new glory, 
It was in vain that she crossed her solitary thickets, but her hopes rose high when, on reaching her open country, she perceived from afar a brilliancy resembling her own. Shall I find my like at last then? cried she, and hastened to the spot. The toil of crawling through bog and reeds gave her little thought, for though she liked best to live in dry grassy spots of the mountains, among the clefts of the rocks, and for most part fed on spicy herbs, and slaked her thirst with mild dew and fresh spring water, yet for the sake of this dear gold, and in hope of this glorious light, she would have undertaken anything you could propose to her. At last, with much fatigue, she reached a wee, rushy spot in the swamp, where our two will-o'-the-wisps were frisking to and fro. She shoved herself along to them, saluted them, was happy to meet such pleasant gentlemen related to her family. The lights glided towards her, skipped up over her and laughed in their fashion. Lady cousin, said they. You are of the horizontal line, yet what of that? It is true we are related only by the look, for observe you. Here both the flames compressing their whole breadth made themselves as high and peaked as possible. How prettily this taper length beseems us gentlemen on the vertical line. Take it not amiss of us, good lady. What family can boast of such a thing? Since there ever was a jack-of-lantern in the world, no one of them has either sat or lain. The snake felt exceedingly uncomfortable in the company of these relations, for, let her hold her head as high as possible, she found that she must bend it to the earth again. Would she stir from the spot? And if in the dark thicket she had been extremely satisfied with her appearance, her splendour in the presence of these cousins seemed to lessen every moment. Nay, she was afraid that at last it would go out entirely. In this embarrassment, she hastily asked if the gentleman could not inform her whence the glittering gold came that had fallen a short while ago into the cleft of the rock. Her own opinion was that it had been a golden shower and had trickled down direct from the sky. The will-o'-the-wisps laughed and shook themselves and a multitude of gold pieces came clinking down about them. The snake pushed nimbly forwards to eat the coin. Much good may it do you, mistress, said the dapper gentleman. We can help you to a little more. They shook themselves again several times with great quickness, so that the snake could scarcely gulp the precious gold fast enough. Her splendour visibly began increasing. She was really shining beautifully, while the lights had in the meantime grown rather lean and short of stature, without, however, in the smallest losing of their good humour. I am obliged to you forever, said the snake. Having got her wind again after the repast, ask of me what you will. All that I can do, I will. Very good, cried the lights. Then tell us where the fair lily dwells. Lead us to the fair lily's palace and garden, and do not lose a moment. We are dying of impatience to fall down at her feet. This service, said the snake with a deep sigh, I can not now do for you. The fair lily dwells, alas, on the other side of the water. Other side of the water, and we have come across it this stormy night. How cruel is the river to divide us. Would it not be possible to call the old man back? 